All right, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lunch and our next session is the keynote fireside discussion where I'll be interviewing Daniel Remote, the co-founder and CEO of VIA. And Daniel has quite an impressive background. Prior to VIA, he built supercomputers designed to discover new pharmaceutical drugs at DE Shaw Research and developed avonic systems for F-15s and F-16s for the Israeli Air Force. He has a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford University and is a graduate of, uh, the Israel, of Israel's Defense Forces Elite Talpia program. And founded in 2012 via a dynamic shuttle-based carpooling service headquartered in New York City and also operating in Chicago and Washington, D.C. Um, VIA also partners with local governments in the U.S. and around the world to provide dynamic public transit services in cities, and they had over 50 of these public-private partnerships with city governments, including ones in Berlin, London, Los Angeles, Singapore, and Tokyo. You can usually get a VIA pool uh, for about $5 going anywhere in Manhattan, and they also offer private rides, airport rides, and they service all five boroughs um, in New York. And we are exceptionally grateful for the opportunity to chat about VIA today. And everyone, please welcome Danielle Ramont. So thank you, Danielle, for being uh, here and taking the time out of your schedule. Um, and thank you for building an incredible company. And for those of you who don't know VIA, you should download your VIA on your apps right now. Um, it is the best carpooling service in the world. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so first, let's get some brief background on VIA. VIA is often grouped in with Uber, Lyft, and Juno as a ride-hailing company. Uh, but in fact, it's much more than a ride-hailing company. It seems more like an a innovative public transit company, or a micro-transit, as it's called. Uh, can you tell us a little about, about VIA's vision and what you saw as an opportunity to start this company in the first place? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I, um I'll start by describing a little bit of the vision we had when we started VIA, so in, in contrast with some of the other ride-hailing apps that you may know, I, I think the way I, I sometimes like to think about VIA is that we are trying to take a, the, the bus, which is this large, um, large vehicle that follows a fixed route on typically a fixed schedule and, and break it up into, you can imagine, sort of four pieces, or it doesn't really matter, three, four, five pieces, and let those those smaller, more agile vehicles now roam around the city much more dynamically so that you can call them to you anywhere on the phone. We usually ask you to walk a little bit so you, you have to contribute to the efficiency of the system. The vehicle, like a bus, is not going to come pick you up exactly where you are. But it, it will come close to you, usually to the nearest corner. You can get on that vehicle which you're sharing with other people and this, this van or shuttle will then drive around the city uh, in the most efficient way to get you to your destination or again, very close to your destination. So the, the idea was to try to create a much more dynamic, uh, data-driven, technology-enabled public transit system rather than simply allowing you to hail a taxi on your phone, uh, which is where I, I think most of the other uh, ride-hailing companies are, are looking to, to operate. And with that, it comes sort of a very different approach to how we provide the service. We, we also uh, provide services, and we talk about regulation here, that fall within a similar regulatory or the same regulatory framework as Uber and Lyft, for example, in New York and Chicago and D.C., we, we also take the software, the technology that we've developed, and as Leah mentioned, we, we, we provide it to other operators. And those operators are typically cities, public transit authorities, uh, they can be uh, university campuses that want to run a campus shuttle or, or corporate uh, uh, organizations that want to provide employee shuttles to and from uh, their, their corporate campuses or within the campuses themselves. And so we can provide that on-demand dynamic shuttle solution to other partners who can then utilize it for, for their purposes. And, and the idea behind all that is that we have a pretty terrible problem with congestion in most cities in the world. That's only getting worse. Um, it creates uh, transportation in the U.S. is the sort of, I think, it's now become the number one source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions or, or number two source for a long time. And, and solving that, it's not entirely clear how to do that. We, we know that the private car is a very inefficient way to get around. It's overwhelming our infrastructure. And we can dig subways like we have in New York, but that's an extremely expensive solution. It's not going to work in every city, in, certainly in the U.S. And the buses are just, they're not really fixing the problem. We've had them for decades, and, and that's not solving the problem. So how, how do we 
try to resolve this urban transportation challenge. And we believe that these dynamic shuttles, essentially if you visualize taking the bus, breaking it up into four pieces and letting it drive around, and we go from instead of having uh, bus stops that are along a line, a fixed line, we now have these virtual bus stops, we call them, dispersed everywhere along the city that these vans can drive between uh, very flexibly. Maybe that's a great, you know, a good way, hopefully a great way to solve our transportation, our urban transportation challenges, and, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and what determines which cities you're going to operate in, or which cities these dynamic shuttles make sense in? Um, maybe something besides demand. What other factors? Yeah. So when we first started, we we actually thought that we would we would be a entirely a technology company. We would develop this this solution, this algorithm, and all the technology around it, and then uh, everybody like the MTA would just be falling over themselves to to use our obviously brilliant idea and uh, and deploy it and, and use it to supplement their existing buses. Uh, or and maybe replace some underutilized routes. It, it turned out uh, very quickly, we were frankly somewhat surprised that they were not interested in talking to us and, uh, and using our solution at all. In fact, we couldn't really get a meeting uh, with anyone to even consider our solution. So we said, okay, we will, we will, we were gonna prove to them that this is gonna work, and we launched ourselves, uh, our own service, starting here in New York, then we expanded to Chicago and to Washington, D.C., and we were targeting, in the United States, the most dense uh, cities that we could sort of get into, and ones that have some awareness of public transportation, because frankly, when you're first starting out, and especially if it's a sort of consumer service, it's very hard to convince people to leave their private car if they have zero awareness of public transit. So someone in Houston just gets out of their house, gets into their car in their garage, and drives wherever they're gonna go. They're not even thinking about an alternative. And so we started in cities where at least people were, were aware that there was an option of doing something else. Uh, over the last two years, as we've built this system out and we have technology we think works, we started to talk to cities and transit authorities all over the world to say, hey, are you interested in using our solution? And started to see a lot more traction, uh, uh, fortunately for us, and we think for them. Um, and so we, uh, we started to partner with, with different cities, as I mentioned. And that really comes from um, just the, the, it's driven by where are the right partners? Uh, what are they interested in doing? And we're sort of looking to, so if we're launching our own solution, we're looking for the densest cities that we can find. Uh, it's really about density. So we've launched in London since, in, 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 in Berlin, um, in Amsterdam. So we're looking for cities where we think there's a good fit. And then otherwise, we think the solution can operate in every city in the world, but we've got to find the right partner to do it with. Are the local regulations or local policies, even in those dense cities, does that impact um, your decision about whether um, to launch there at all, or how, how does it impact your decision? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you imagine one city that could be fantastic, I think, for a solution like ours is Tokyo. Uh, it's extremely dense. There, there's, there's severe, there's an excellent public transportation system, but also severe traffic problems. And there's an increasingly aging population that is finding it difficult to drive and get around. There's, there, I think there's a real need, but the regulations don't allow us to operate there at all, for example. So, so yes, the, the regulatory environment. You know, London is relatively open for launching a, a, our own service. We call it a consumer service. Um, other cities, are, say uh, Madrid, is, is quite difficult to do so. So on this regulation point, so at this conference, we are interested in understanding how different regulations and policies can both help spur innovation and other times it may hinder it. Um, or sometimes regulations and policies cause changes in business models or cause companies to pivot into different areas and sectors. Um, at the start of this year, uh, we saw some major policy and regu uh, regulatory changes impacted, um, that have impacted for higher vehicles in New York. Uh, such as Via, Uber, Juno, and Lyft. Um, so let's go one by one for our audience here, and then we'll touch on um, all three of them. So the first one was the new cap on driver licenses that was passed in um, August 2018. Uh, the second one is the minimum uh, earnings rule for drivers, and then the third, um, and actually a fourth with the congestion <laughs> pricing. So the third is there are new charges, new surcharges on all rides in Manhattan. And, um, and then in, we also have the new congestion pricing plan that was passed uh, this week, actually. Uh, so we can start with the driver's license cap one. Uh, so uh, again, for our audience, in an effort to combat road congestion, this rule prohibits for higher vehicles, and that includes Via and Uber and Lyft and Juno and New York. Um, from adding new drivers to their platforms for an entire year, with the exception of licenses for uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles. Um, so this means that companies would only be able to use their existing drivers or perhaps compete away other drivers from other platforms. 
Uh, so first of all, what do you think of this, of this uh, regulation? Yeah, so our, our, our regulators in, in New York City and New York State have been awfully busy the last uh, few months yeah. and have... Uh, um, uh, a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Yeah. I, I think it's... it's uh, so we, we can talk about them individually. Th this one, so just to be clear, it targets the vehicle. So you can add new drivers. You cannot add... There are no new vehicle licenses. Um, and, and the argument behind it was, was one that's actually quite difficult to in the sort of in the public sphere is actually quite difficult to argue against. And this is what it said. It said, if you are in New York City, you've experienced it, congestion's getting worse, traffic speeds are going down, buses are moving more slowly. And in the last few years, we've seen an increase in the number of four higher, higher vehicles from 40,000 to 100,000. Therefore, we must uh, uh, stop this crazy uh, growth in the four hire vehicle industry, and we must cap licenses and not allow new vehicles. And you know, if you're just listening to that naively, that makes a lot of sense. Traffic's getting worse, lots more four hire vehicles, let's, let's stop them. I, I, you know, I at least believe the reality is much more complex. I, I think, there, first of all, there's a, there's a missing linkage there. Uh, to, it's, it's not been demonstrated that the four hire vehicles are the cause of traffic. Um, in fact, there was a study commissioned by the city in 2015 uh, by the Taxi and Limousine Commission that, that McKinsey did looking at this problem because in 2015, the, the administration uh, city tried to pass a similar rule and, and, and was unsuccessful. And so they paid about a million dollars to McKinsey to study this problem. And McKinsey's, the McKinsey report said, yes, traffic has gotten worse. Four hire vehicles are not the cause. Uh, the, the, causes are, so, so the causes are increased economic activity, trucks and deliveries, uh, just a, a, a significant increase in the number of deliveries in the city, and, and construction. So if you drive around New York City at all, and you're stuck in a traffic jam, I think this may resonate, at least it does for me, almost without fail, at the end of that traffic jam is either construction or, or trucks that are blocking the road. And, and that's, that's just my anecdotal experience. Um, and, and, and you know, this McKinsey report supported it. So, so yes, there's been a very large increase in the number of four hire vehicles, but at least the city's own study suggested that that was not the, uh, at least a significant contributor to the increase in traffic. And what we see in, 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 in our data and in Uber's data and Lyft's data, which is shared with the Taxi and Limousine Commission, is that where, the, where people complain about traffic, which is in Manhattan, actually the number of four hire vehicle trips that, that are being provided when you add up all the yellow taxi trips and the four hire vehicle trips, that number has stayed fairly constant over the last two or three years. What's ha where all these new four hire vehicles are going is they're going to the outer boroughs, which is also where Uber has said they're seeing all of their growth and, and we are seeing a lot of our growth and Lyft and so forth, where there could also be a congestion problem down the road, but right now that's not what the problem is. And they're, they're solving what is really an unmet need. We're, we're getting around the outer boroughs, you don't have great access to subway, you don't have great bus routes, and frankly, you, you can't get a yellow taxi, so you know, what is one to do? And, and, and I think these four higher vehicles have provided a real solution uh, in the outer boroughs. So, so to us, and that's not to say, by the way, that globally or even nationally, four higher vehicles, the, the, sort of the explosion in, in Uber services, via services, whatever, is not impacting uh, congestion. I'm not, I'm not making that case at all. I think San Francisco may be a completely different story. But at least in New York City, this, this was not the cause. And, and I think there's something to be said about enforcing rules against trucks, uh, blocking the box, uh, you know, and, and other things that I, I think we, the city is not doing particularly well. Nevertheless, uh, um, the, the sort of the industry as a whole, fire industry as a whole, lost this battle because it's just impossible to make that argument. Traffic got worse, so many more fire vehicles, we need to put a, we need to put a stop to this. And, uh, and so that law was passed. I think it's frankly a very bad uh, idea to cap it in this way. I think from a, just a, if you think about this very complex market that is really a marketplace that we are operating in, this uh, hard cap creates all sorts of unexpected economic uh, consequences. For example, it creates a market in these licenses. So you go back to the yellow taxi medallion system that used to exist where the right to operate a yellow taxi was worth a million dollars. Who was making money off of that? For the most part, folks uh, like uh, Mike, our dear friend Michael Cohen and, and, his, and his associates, not the drivers. And, and that market um, is extremely inefficient and just sort of leads to cost for, for the consumer. There's also no reasonable exemption other than the, 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 the wheelchair accessible vehicles. So for example, we asked the city to give us an exemption to add up to 1,000 vehicles during this year that are high capacity vehicles. So part of our problem is VIAs, we don't have enough vans to use in the city. 
they're, they're just not enough for higher vans. We're constantly, if you've seen these Mercedes minivans that we use in the city, Mercedes Metruses, we're constantly adding them, but it, you have to convince drivers to go and buy them and then, and then drive on the via platform and so forth. And, and it's been happening primarily over the, had been happening over the previous year, and we asked for a small exemption to add up to 1,000 high capacity, so six passenger or more vehicles. And you know that was not uh, that was not considered, which I think would have would have been a good exemption. So overall, you know, to me, this regulation is probably not the right way to approach the market, the, the the challenges of the market. There are other ways, which some of the other regulations I think get at very effectively. But just a blunt cap to say, okay, you cannot add any more vehicles. I think I, I don't think that's the that's the approach I would have taken. So what would be a pro the a better approach to tackle road congestion? That you think would be a better solution? Yeah, so I think some of the things that have been done since, which have to do with congestion pricing, are much more effective. So if you say, okay, I, I want to um, prevent these single occupancy vehicle trips in the city, and I, and I want to prevent them, and by the way, I don't think it's just for hire vehicles that are the problem, I think it's taxis and for hire vehicles and private cars, and I want to do something about reducing the number of these congestion causing, inefficient ways that people are using the road network, then let's charge people to do that and, and let's charge them differentially, which New York State did. Let's charge them more if they're on their own in a car and let's charge them less if they're sharing a car with other passengers. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense and creates that balance between, okay, still giving access to people, allowing the market to operate efficiently. Uh, in the end, I'm at least a little bit of a capitalist. I think we should let the market do what it's doing, but, but create the right incentives for the market to operate in, in the right way. Okay, and I think that gets at one of the ones I wanted to talk yep. about, but we'll jump into the, um, the next one is the minimum uh, earnings payroll. So this rule um, effectively requires all ride hailing companies to pay drivers a minimum wage of 17, per, um, 22 per hour after expenses. Uh, but interestingly, uh, via drivers last year earned an average of 22.94 uh, per hour after expenses, way above the minimum earnings threshold. Uh, so some ride-hailing companies, such as Lyft and Juno, um, they filed a lawsuit, and they've also noted that this rule is leading to increases in fair prices and lower demand. Um, and how about for VIA? Uh, how is this rule impacting VIA, or how do you foresee it impacting VIA? Yeah, so this is an interesting, you know, and I have to say, I've only ever been on this side of the, of the debate. I've never been a regulator, so I don't know what they're dealing with. Maybe they're, I'm sure their job is very difficult, and actually having to decide how to regulate a brand new, very complex industry is, is really challenging. And I actually think we know the folks at the Taxi and Limousine Commission, for example, very well, and they're all very smart, they're very well-intentioned, and they're generally trying to do the right thing. It's just, it's a really hard problem. So here's the problem they're facing. They're seeing, uh, you know, they're facing sort of a, a series of problems, really, they're, as, a, as a city body, they, they see uh, um, taxi drivers who are committing suicide, this is tragic, and they're seeing for hire vehicle drivers who are committing suicide. I mean, that's sort of the extreme expression of it, but what it's coming from is that these guys are, are, are not making a, a, enough money. Uh, there's a, these growing numbers of them, tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 of these guys, and the city would like to do something about that, and, and they'd like to ensure that folks who are driving for via Lyft, Uber, Juno are making a fair wage and at least a sort of minimum wage. However, the city does not have the authority to impose a minimum wage. And imposing, it's the state authority, and imposing minimum wage in general for contractors is sort of somewhat unprecedented and, and doesn't really, you know, could be challenged uh, in, in court. So what they do is they commission a study that tries to get at, okay, drivers who are driving for these for hire vehicle companies, how much are they earning per hour? And how do you even know that? Because they're driving, they're getting paid per trip, um, not per hour, that's not the formula that any of these companies, except VIA, is, is using. So how, how are you able to tell what these drivers are earning and, and, and how do you deduct expenses, which is kind of complicated and depends on the type of vehicle you're driving and the duration and the type of trip that you're providing and so forth. So this, two academics uh, who did this study came back with a formula that translated, it's not particularly complicated, translated how much you were getting paid per trip and then the utilization of, of, of that company, uh, uh, so company-specific utilization number that's basically, for a given driver, on average, what piece of the hour was that driver driving a passenger? So they were getting paid for. So if, if it's 50% and the driver's getting paid $10 per trip, then that driver's making $5 an hour. That, that's sort of how they translated. And it turned out that um, if you uh, run a service that is providing private rides, uh, for the most part, and your goal is to provide the shortest wait times possible, so that whenever you open your app, 
you're seeing a two, three, four minute wait time, which I think generally characterizes uh, many of the other ride hailing companies, then not surprisingly, you have to have a lot of drivers sitting around not doing very much. Uh, otherwise, you won't get that sort of liquidity in the marketplace, which means your utilization is very low. And so you, you end up kind of multiplying whatever the driver's getting paid per trip by this, by this very low number, and drivers end up making $14 an hour on average before expenses, before they're paying for their car and their gas and, and whatnot. Um, and so the city said, okay, we're going to impose this minimum earnings rule. We're, we're going to say, depending on your utilization, the higher your utilization, the lower you'll be able to pay, but you'll have to pay this minimum per trip that's actually quite a bit higher than what you're paying today. Um, I, I think you know, it's a very complicated, I'll come back to V in a second, but it's a very complicated, again, um, marketplace that's hard to know how a rule like this is going to affect the, the different players. But generally that feels like, a, like an interesting approach and probably one that's worth trying and, and does provide the drivers some sense that they're hourly earning. So if they go out and they start driving around, they're, they're getting a minimum uh, hourly guarantee that, that hopefully covers minimum wage. On the VIA side, we typically pay for many reasons which we can discuss. We have a very different model. If we put too many vehicles out on the road, we will never fill them with enough passengers. So we actually have to make sure that we we match the number of vehicles who, that are out on the road on our platform to the demand that we're actually going to see. Uh, so we have to every day, every hour, every minute predict how many ride requests we're gonna get and try to get just the right number of vehicles on the road, which means our utilization is much higher and the drivers are busier a much higher percent of the time and they also have a lot of passengers in their vehicle on average. And so when you look at the TLC data, as, as Lee mentioned, via drivers were on average earning 20 some dollars per hour uh, already significantly above what the TLC was mandating. So you know, we were obviously very happy with this and have tried to talk about it as, as publicly as much as we can. We think it's great. There you go, another, great, another, <laughs> another opportunity. Another opportunity. Uh, can I get a time check real quick? <laughs> Forgot to bring my watch up. Talk too quick. Okay, great. Um, then I'll move on to, I wanna make sure that there is a time for Q&A at the end before we do. Um, so on the, uh, I guess we can, we can touch about this again on the different surcharges. Uh, so the third, and for our, for our audience as well, um, what Daniel had mentioned before is that there's, um, the New York State implemented a new surcharge that started uh, January 1st of this year and the fee is 250 for yellow cabs and 275 for four higher vehicles and applies to trips um, that pass through a zone covering Manhattan um, south of 96th Street. Um, and for pool rides, actually, as Daniel mentioned, it's less, um, and VIA is mostly pooled rides, and that fee is 75 cents. So it's 75 cents for pooled rides and 275 for, um, for higher vehicle rides. Uh, in general, what do you think of this policy? Um, and I guess, how do you, foresee it impacting via services? Yeah, I think it's an excellent policy, okay. frankly. Uh, so the, the details one can argue about, but I think the idea of imposing a surcharge uh, on private vehicle, private for hire private rides that is significantly higher than, a sh than okay. on shared rides, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the shared ride surcharge should have been even lower, but you know, I'm not objective. Um, but I, I think the, the idea is that if you're choosing to share your vehicle, you are taking up less road space, you're using less of the infrastructure that we all pay for through our taxes, therefore you should be charged a lower fee. If you're choosing to ride alone, you should probably pay more. And uh, it, it still gives you, so I think what's nice about that policy is it still gives you the ability to get around at a low fare that's, that's very accessible to people, so it doesn't create this situation where only the rich can get around town. But if you're choosing to take up the whole car, th then, then you pay more. And by the way, this was, not obvious, this was not an obvious outcome. It's the first time in the country that this distinction has been made in, in charging and uh, applying taxes or some sort of surcharge to four higher vehicles. So in that sense, New York State was is sort of ahead of everybody else in its thinking. And, and I, you know, I think it's, it's really, it's a commendable policy. And what we've seen is that since that was implemented in February, uh, we've seen a, a significant increase in the demand for shared rides over private rides. Uh, so it works uh, as far as we can tell. Um, great, so I wanna close off to uh, you know, ask some closing questions and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, so one of them is, given everything that we've discussed here and everything that's going on in New York, um, how do you think in general, if you have any thoughts about how policymakers should approach implementing 
new policies or regulations that are both conducive to innovation and yet meet important city goals and social concerns such as road congestion? Yeah, tough question, a tough right? Question. Yeah. <laughs> um, Million dollar question. I, I think, so some things that the, I, I at least see that the Taxi and Limousine Commission doing, I think, works pretty well. I, I think they engage with all the stakeholders. So, so they try to listen and, and, and hear what the different concerns are and what would work. And then when they put out a policy, which I think also works, they usually share it with the different stakeholders in advance and give folks a chance to comment and say, this is going to work and this is not going to work for so and so reason. And then I think you have to really try to put the you know, may, maybe a couple other thoughts. As a regulator, I think you have to recognize your limits. So sometimes uh, there have been requests that say, we are worried about consumers, we're worried about certain uh, features in the app or certain features in the product that are not good for consumers. Therefore, we're going to require that every version of the app that you release, we will approve as the regulator. I, I think that's that's a to do that well as a regulator without creating a, a sort of a really strong barrier to innovation and to and to progress is really hard, um, and that's probably not the the way that you know again that I would approach. I recognize that as as a regulator, you're setting yourself up to 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 try to do something that's very very difficult. I think similarly, a lot of times around data, the regulators feel that they can if they got the data from us, they could do. Uh, all these things and then, and, then, and then sort of make judgments about the business that are actually very, very complex. So I, I would try to s sort of say, okay, these are my limits. I'm going to try to put forward some policies that, that impact the market, play, the market in the direction I want it to go. But I wouldn't take on all this burden uh, that is very hard to, to meet. Um, so so, so that's, that's one. And the other is, you know, again, I would try to, if I were a regulator, I would try to influence the market through sort of these, these more um, gradual, I don't know what the right word is exactly, but like, like charging a little bit more for one type of ride versus another, versus these absolute things like, okay, now there's a cap, or this cannot be done anymore. So I think that has some adverse consequences that are hard to predict. Okay, great. And what can we expect next for VIA? More public-private partnerships, VIA scooters, maybe the April Fool's joke on <laughs> VIA bike sharing <laughs> is right, a hint yeah. for something. <laughs> we, we share all sorts of things at VIA. Um, I, I, you know, I th what we are trying to do is, is we, we believe that this is actually an important thing to do, what, what we are doing. That if, as I said, it was not obvious to, to New York State legislature, legislators when they started the process for the congestion charge that there was a difference between private rides and shared rides. And I think having a conversation with them and explaining that there was this difference is very important led to this policy that is actually driving real change on the ground in, in, in New York City where a lot more people are sharing their rides rather than driving alone, which you know, I at least think is a good thing. So I, I think we, you know, we have to consider we've got this road infrastructure that is kind of a, it's a bit of a unique uh, infrastructure in the sense that we don't pay to use it at the moment. Well, now that's gonna change in New York, but it's, it's one of the rare uh, publicly maintained and funded pieces of infrastructure that we can use without paying anything to use. Even when you go to a, maybe libraries are like this, but generally if you, even if you go to a national park, you have to pay some entrance fees uh, to use that park. So how we use this very critical for economic activity uh, piece of infrastructure I think, is, I think is really important. And at the moment we are sort of used to this concept that we're either using uh, buses or trains or we're driving ourselves or taking a taxi. And that's because that's really all we've been able to do given our existing technology and vehicles. But there's this new mode that is this, this in-between hybrid dynamic shuttle mode that it feels a bit strange, but when you see it operating at scale, it, it achieves these, these uh, much higher levels of efficiency on the one hand and lower cost per ride and a much greater convenience uh, for consumers and could really be a bridge between the private car and the bus. And so for us, you know, we're trying to convince cities all over the world to use our solution. Um, one, because it's good business for us, but two, because if we think it's good, it's good policy for those cities. So where next? I hope we'll be in a thousand cities by the end of next year. Oh, wow. maybe we'll talk about that next. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, and let's open it up to Q&A from the audience. I think we have until 1.15 is the timing. So, yeah. Oh, do you, uh, for, sorry, I should have given instructions. Uh, the microphones are up there, so please uh, go up to the microphones. Hi. Hi. So um, I know VIA won the bid in Arlington, and has, that program has been deemed successful. 
Can you talk about uh, what you have accomplished so far by city partnerships and what the vision is for maybe like 10 years later? Sure, I don't know about 10 years, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so Arlington, Texas is an interesting city. It's a, it was a, for a very long time the largest city in the United States, about 400,000 residents that did not have any public transportation. God love those Texans. Um, they, they, uh, the, the residents of Arlington voted down every ballot measure uh, to support public transportation over decades. And eventually, about three, three or so years ago, they were able to secure some funding for a bus route that ran for about a year called the Max Bus that connected Arlington to, to a train station. And um, that bus, at, I, I, you know, I think, again, Texans just don't typically use public transit very often. Uh, that bus uh, had about 200, 250 riders at, at peak, but on average it was seeing about 100 riders a day. Um, and, and we were connected through, uh, is a long story, but to, to the city of Arlington and explained our solution. And, and it wasn't quite that they swapped out the bus for our solution, but they were planning to decommission the bus anyway, so they decommissioned this Max bus and then effectively replaced it with our solution using a, 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 essentially a very similar budget. And our solution was to take um, about 10 vans that are branded as Via uh, Arlington. So they're actually, they look like they're a city of Arlington service and you can use our app to book them anywhere, and the city wanted to charge passengers, I think it's $3 or so, uh, to get around uh, a, a good chunk of Arlington in, in a VIA-like solution. If you ever use VIA in New York, you know what it's like, you book a ride on your phone, you walk to a corner, the vehicle comes and picks you up, and you share it with others as, as you go wherever you're going. You get dropped off on a corner next to your destination. So this is the solution that we're currently providing in the city of Arlington. The first year, we got about a million dollars from them, 900 and some thousand dollars, to, to subsidize this service effectively, because at $3 a ride, it's very, very difficult to, to cover the cost of providing the service. And that was, was, I believe, comparable to the budget that they were spending on the bus. And we saw about three to 400 uh, riders a day on average very, very quickly, uh, rising to now about 700 uh, passengers a day. So if you compare that to the 100 or so that the bus was seeing, and now they've doubled the budget to about $2.2 .2 million a year so that we can expand the service to additional parts of Arlington. So, so here's a, a situation where Previously, these folks were either not going anywhere, one might imagine, or were, were driving themselves because no other public transportation. And now they're using uh, this shared ride service that's effectively like the local public bus, but it's dynamic, it's technology enabled, it doesn't have fixed schedules. The number of buses or vans that we deploy at any one time is, de is driven by data, by the demand that we know is going to, is likely to be uh, present in the city at that time. And so it's a much more efficient solution and it's, it's gotten really, really good reviews and I think the city's very happy with it. And, and we're trying to replicate that model effectively all over the world. So you mentioned in Singapore, in Los Angeles, there's a service that we launched recently in London uh, soon and, and, and many other cities, small and large. So this can operate in, in large dense cities but also in small uh, smaller, more sparse cities. In New York, we operate our own service. We don't yet have a partnership, but we're hoping to convince the MTA to work with us. Um, other questions? All right, we have one. Um, and so I was wondering, uh, given the immense complexity of the system that you're building and the way that it's technology enabled and the way that it relies on enormous amounts of data in terms of where the riders are going to be and where the vans are actually there to pick them up, how have you dealt with or how do you plan to deal with natural disaster disruptions and other kinds of shocks that would like reduce your ability to make those predictions accurately? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, that, that's a tough problem to solve. Um, I think, you know, we've seen in New York several times where there are major storms. How does, how does one respond to that? Um, I, I think th in those cases, oftentimes what we see, because we don't have a lot of, fortunately yet, we don't have a lot of data about them, we see that the system efficiency is, is significantly impacted. Uh, it's also, it just, there are just some, you know, at the end of the day, the, via or Uber, it doesn't really matter, it, it, you know, the, your experience is not in the app. So if I'm paying you via Venmo, my entire experience lives in my mobile device. That, that's, that's all that I experience. So if I'm playing Candy Crush or whatever, it's, it's, that's, that's it. If I'm taking a Via, it starts with the app, but then there's the whole city that I need to deal with and the vehicle, and we don't have autonomous vehicles yet, so, so the driver, and then there are other passengers. So there's a, there's a real world piece to the experience that's very complex. And, uh, and very high friction. And, and so in these situations of natural disasters, for example, you, you have uh, many issues that come to play that have nothing to do with the technology. For example, that drivers are either unwilling or unable to, to 
show up basically and, and you don't have the, the sort of supply that you need to support the demand. And that's gonna be true for any transportation system. I think whether it's a traditional public transit bus-like system or train or you know the subway shut down. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest concerns about ride sharing is the fate of gig economy workers. And um, it's great that via drivers are paid more. And anecdotally, my via drivers always seem a little bit happier with the company than my Uber drivers do. Um, but I'm sure that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes in terms of how you think about your contract employees and what types of support and transparency and communication and things like that you may offer them. Can you talk a little bit more about how via thinks about these issues and what's being done? Yeah. So our drivers, uh, depending on, on the city and the model in which we're operating, but for example in New York, our contractors and they, they own their own vehicles or they lease their own vehicles and they're driving on the platform essentially providing rides. And um, you know, when I, when I look at them, they, they definitely do not behave as, em, as employees. So I, th I think if, in, if driven to choose between these two classifications of contractors or employees, they're definitely acting like contractors. I think if you were a VI employee and tomorrow you decided you weren't gonna show up because you were gonna go work for Uber that day, you know, I might be upset with you and think that that was not the right way for you to behave as an employee. Or if in the middle of the day you dropped out for four hours because Uber was offering you more, you know, a higher surge rate or, or whatnot, which is sort of how this industry generally operates. Having said that, I, I also think that as, con as this piece of the uh, sort of labor force grows, which there's some conflicting reports on that. I think there was, a, there was a sense a few years ago that contractors in general and gig economy employees, sort of workers, that that sector was just exploding. And then there's some studies done and data came out showing that actually the number of contractors in the US had shrunk uh, for a while. So I think there's some question around how big is this segment? But as this segment becomes more prominent and grows, I, I think there's some creative solutions that we can come up with, this is not my idea, things have been talked about, of having a sort of in, in intermediate classification where you have the flexibility, for example, as an Uber driver or via driver or Lyft driver to provide services for all three companies based on what is working best for you at that, at that moment, but you also have certain protections and have access to health benefits and, and to, to medical insurance and, and other uh, types of benefits typically granted only to employees. Uh, a version of this, for example, exists in the UK, and and I think I think it would be it would be important for um, whoever's probably in the next administration to think hard about how to implement that in the United States as well. Great. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, come on up. I think this might be the last question. Right? What time is it? Hi. In a, my research on the sharing economy, I learned about a company that's big in Europe and not in the United States. Blah blah car which is a long distance ride sharing um, app. And um, I was wondering, does VIA have any intention on providing longer distance rides? And what regulations or barriers, if any, would exist regarding crossing state lines? Yeah, Blah Blah Car is an interesting phenomenon. For those of you who don't know it, it's a, it's a service that started in France that allowed people to um, share their ride with someone. It's, these in, it's, it, it's usually long distance, or it's been long distance rides, intercity, so you can go between cities. And you can, if you find someone, if you want to go from Paris to Bordeaux, you would post it on, on their website, and then, or, or you would post that you are going from Paris to Bordeaux, and they would match drivers who are already planning to make that trip with passengers who would like to get to that destination. Uh, so that was the way that marketplace was built. I, to me, it's an interesting example, and it, it, actually it's one of the, I think, the most interesting examples of how regulation affects uh, sort of companies and economic behavior, because it is, it is, to me, the only example I know of that has been able to scale with what I call uh, non-professional supply. So, so let me explain this. So most marketplaces uh, that you look at have a story. Take Airbnb. The story at Airbnb is that you own a, an asset, your home, and Airbnb allows you to rent a room or when you're on vacation to rent your entire apartment, your entire house, basically kind of extract some revenue out of your asset uh, on the side while you're using it for your own personal use. That's mostly a fiction, uh, frankly. Most of the people on Airbnb who are renting rooms or homes to you do it as a business. They are professionals. It, it, is, it is their job to 
buy uh, property and then rent it to you. Now, if you, if you talk to Airbnb, they'll say 95% of our listings, I don't know the exact numbers, so they'll probably yell at me later, but uh, you know, the vast majority of our listings are by non-professional uh, hosts. They, these are people who are doing exactly what our story says, which is that they own their own home and they're renting a room. Yes, but the vast majority of transactions are not by these 95% of or however many people who, who are on the platform. The vast majority, because they're only renting their room or their home once a year, the vast majority of transactions are by these professional folks who own multiple properties and are renting them every single day. This is also true for eBay these days, right? eBay started as a, as a platform where you could sell your, your excess stuff and now is dominated by power sellers. It's true for almost every marketplace is dominated in the end by professionals who are using that platform to sell their services. Blah Blah Car is one of the unique examples where that's not the case, where people are just able to they were able to scale a marketplace in a really meaningful way with non-professional supply. People who were truly driving from Bordeaux to Paris or Paris to Bordeaux that day and wanted to fill the seats in their car to save a little bit of money on gas and blah, blah, car would connect them. And I, I think the reason that that scaled was because France had a very interesting regulatory quirk, which is that SNCF, the, the, the French National Railway, owned a monopoly on all intercity travel and did not allow bus travel. You could only get around by train, primarily, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Uh, and, and so it was very, very expensive to travel from Bordeaux to Paris. You could only take the SNCF train. And so BlaBlaCar filled this very interesting regulatory gap in the market, much like when Uber launched, they filled a really interesting regulatory gap in the taxi market where there was just massive excess demand for taxis versus the supply that, that the medallion system or whatever allowed. Uh, the taxi uh, sort of taxi services. And so I think Blabacar in that sense is sort of a really interesting example. Now what's happened as a result of Blabacar is that this market was deregulated in France and now buses like Flix buses and so Flix bus uh, are allowed and I think that's really hurt uh, the Blabacar business. So it's an interesting story. That's right. I don't Yeah, and it's a transaction that's fairly expensive for the driver, right? Driving, the, the amount of gas and wear and tear and so on your vehicle driving a long distance is fairly high. So if someone paid you that back, that would be worth it. If you're doing an intra-city trip and your wear and tear and gas cost is $4, so the max that you can collect without making a profit is $4, are you really going to buy, if, and you already own a car, so you're not that you know, you're not that in need of cash if you are able to own a car. So are you really going to go out of your way for 10 minutes to pick someone up for $4? Probably not if it's not your job, right? That, that's, that's generally what, why these marketplaces have scaled in the ways they have. Sorry, I know we're out of time. Yeah, we're out. Thank you so much. Let's give a welcome to it. <laughs>